So communication is key to a healthy relationship. I heard once, if you go for marriage counseling, if you have issues uh, in your marriage and you sit down with the counselor, one of the first questions that they're going to ask is, so how are you guys doing in your communication? Are you guys talking to each other? Right? Because when the communication chain is broken, when there's no communication or miscommunication or lack of communication, maybe over-communication, uh, that's when the relationship gets really, really difficult and, and hard. The same is true with our relationship with God. I think one reason why we tend to struggle with our relationship with God is because we struggle in the area of communication. And so Psalm 19 is written by King David, and it's all about God's word. It's all about communication. And the main idea is pretty simple. It's this. God speaks. God speaks. God is not silent. He speaks. And this is something that we see in the Bible from cover to cover, especially in the opening chapter of Genesis when the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. And one of the first things that he does is he says, let there be light. And there was light. So from the opening chapter, from the opening verses of Genesis, right off the bat, we learn that God speaks and his word has power. His word has power to, to bring light. And also, after that, he creates all things, so he gives life. So God's word has power to give light and life. And all throughout scripture, this is something that we see. God is constantly speaking to his people in different ways. So how does God speak to us today? That's the question that we want to ask, right? We see how God speaks in the Bible. We see how God speaks in different ways, but specifically to us. How does God speak to us? That's the question that I want to answer today. So God speaks, first of all, he speaks to us through nature. God speaks to us through nature. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So just look at the verbs. Declare, proclaims, pour out speech, reveals knowledge. It's all about communication, right? It's all about speech. So who's doing the talking here? The Bible says the heavens the sky, so things that were created by God, so creation is doing the talking, but they're not talking about themselves, they're talking about God and his glory. In other words, day to day, night to night, through creation, we are able to see God's glory, his greatness, his grandness, and his beauty. It says in verse 3, there is no speech, nor, nor are there words whose voice is not heard, which is ironic, right? Because we're talking about God speaking, and yet, it says, when creation speaks, there's no speech, there's no words, and, and there's no voice. Now, how does this make sense? Well, we do this all the time, too. We don't have to speak out words in order to communicate. This is called nonverbal communication, right? We, we, we express what we, what's inside of us through our gestures, through our facial expressions. And by the way, this is... Uh, another important thing that you have to learn, especially if you're a, a guy who's trying to go on a date, you have to learn the cues, right? It's not just the, what the words are, are, the words that are being spoken, but you have to understand the body language, the gesture. And for husbands, you have to understand that's, that's how you have a happy marriage, right? Just because your wife says, I'm okay, it doesn't mean that she's always okay. Make sure that you see her face, her gestures. And so I think it's really, really important that we understand that it's not just simply through words, but through gestures or different ways. Nonverbal communication is key. I mean, even with my kids, when they are disappointed at me, when they are mad at me, upset at me, they're not going to say to my face, I hate you. Uh, well, maybe one day they'll do that. <laughs> but instead, they'll go in their room. They'll try to hide. And what, what are they trying to say? Uh, well, they're not speaking anything, but they're communicating to me that I'm upset, like, that I don't want to be with you right now. So nonverbal communication or a simple hug or you know, a simple gesture could really brighten someone's day. And so we see that we too communicate in nonverbal ways. And what God is saying is this, creation it is saying something, and it's saying something in a nonverbal way. And last week, you know, when Pastor Daniel was speaking, he talked about how we spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars, thousands and thousands of dollars, just to go out and see the ocean or to see the mountain. There's something just magical, something that's beautiful about just sitting and looking at nature. 
And I was thinking about this. Why is it so satisfying to look at nature? One thing that we said was, well, it helps us to take the attention off of us, and we can focus on something else. But notice that something else is not just a thing, but it's a beautiful creation of God. That it's the artwork of God. When you look at the ocean, when you look at the mountains, when you look at the sky above, the stars in the sky, the reason why you are filled with joy, the reason why you are filled with wonder is because you're not just seeing a thing, but you are seeing something that was beautifully created by an artistic God. The reason why you have pets at home instead of robots, right, is because there's something unique and special about God's creation, something that has life. The reason why we want plants in our home instead of just random drawings is because there's something that's unique about God's creation. I mean, one day, Timothy brought a caterpillar home, and so he, he put it in, in this, this plastic bottle, right? And he was just staring at it for hours, right? He wants to play with it, touch it. And then even for me, I'm like just staring at this caterpillar, right? And sometimes I just forgot how, how crazy creation is, like how this caterpillar moves, how this caterpillar wants to get a cocoon and, and, and all that, how, how much he eats, right? It's like fascinating. I think the reason why we, are, we gravitate towards creation, things that are created not by man but by God, is because there's a special message in creation. The Bible tells us that creation declares the glory of God. God. It says in verse 2, day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. Verse 4, it says, their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the, the world. And so you see that this message that creation is communicating, it's available for all people and it's available everywhere. That's the beauty of, of this. For all people at all times, God is speaking to people about his glory, about who he is. And one example that he gives is the sun. He says, you know that sun, that bright, shining thing in the heavens, right? For ancient people, that's, that's the biggest thing in, in the sky, right? That's the brightest thing in the sky. And that's why they had a tendency to worship the sun. It's because the sun changes everything. I remember one time I was in the deserts of, of Egypt, and I was spending a night there. I never slept in the desert before, so I underestimated how cold it was going to be. All night, right, I was just in my sleeping bag. And I, I was freezing, so I wake up pretty much every, every, every hour, and I'm trying to put more socks on, more clothes on. It's so cold. And there's this one thought I had in my mind. I wish the sun would come out. Like, the sun would change everything. And sure enough, when the sun was rising, like, what seemed horrible, the desert seemed like this dark, cold place. Like, once the sun came up, it was this beautiful place that had that, 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 that place was no longer a place of suffering. Like, I was able to enjoy, really, God's creation. So you understand, you know, a society that did not have electricity, in a society that did not have energy the way that we are able to create energy, in the ancient world, the sun meant everything to the people, and that's why people worship the sun. But notice what David says about the sun. He says, the sun comes out of a tent that was created by God. And we know scientifically this, is, this does not make sense because the sun is there and the earth is rotating around the sun, but David is not writing um, a, a, a lab report here. He's writing a song. He's, he's poetically describing a reality that he sees. It says in verse 5, when the sun comes out, it's like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. So I remember on my wedding day, like when I left my chamber, my house, it's like I was filled with joy excitement, a new beginning. And what the Bible is saying is every time the sun leaves its chamber, every time the sun is rotating, it's filled with joy. It says the sun is like a strong man who runs its course with joy. So if you're like me and if you're weak, when you run, you feel pain and it hurts. It hurts your legs, it hurts your lungs, and you don't really enjoy it. But if you're a strong man, if you're a runner, if you're conditioned, an athlete, and that's kind of what the idea behind the strongman, it's a champion, it's a warrior. If you're conditioned to run, like when you're running, it's like, this is amazing, right? Like you feel alive, your blood is, is pumping. Uh, and so a strongman runs with joy. And what the Bible is saying is the sun is running in such a way. Uh, the sun is not just there randomly, but God is, is taking care of the sun. And also, the sun is filled with joy because it has a purpose for God. 
And so in verse 6 it says, It's rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit to the ends of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Again, everyone can see the sun. I remember, I can't remember, I will actually, I can't remember exactly where I heard this, but I remember like there was this long distance couple. Um, uh, they were, they're basically like living on the opposite ends uh, of, 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 of a country. And they're talking and they're kind of this new couple. And so like, I love you. Like, you know, I miss you. I wish we can be together, but at least we have, we're under the same sun. Or at least we're looking at the same sun or the same moon. Like it's this idea that everyone has access to the sun and access to the moon. And just like you put a satellite up in the sky so that you can get maximum coverage. What God is doing is he's putting things in the sky so that he, there can be maximum coverage so that everyone can see and recognize his glory and his beauty in creation. So God speaks to us through nature. God speaks to us through nature. Um, I love going up to the mountains, uh, hiking, because when you go up to the mountains and you look at all the mountains around you, the idea that gets into your heart is not like, man, I feel really, really big right now, right? The idea is that this world is so big, huge, and I'm so little, like, I'm so small. Like, when you're in your room, when each wall is there in concrete, and everything in your house, by the way, is, is created so that it would serve you, so that it would be good to you so that you can have access to it. Everything is centered around you. Like, the tendency that you have in your house is that you tend to focus on yourself, right? Uh, the same is true when you go online, because when you go online, you kind of have a lot of power. You have a lot of, you feel like you have a lot of significance. You can choose who you want to be with. You can choose what you want to see. It's like um, on YouTube or on social media, they are constantly feeding you exactly what you want to see based on what your search engine. And so, like, you're getting content that is catered for you, and it's basically saying you're important, you're significant, go buy this, go buy that, access this, access that, think in this way. But when you go out in nature, like, there's this overwhelming sense that you don't feel that secure. <laughs> you don't feel that significant. Like, at night in nature, if you've been camping and you hear, like, a small sound, it's like, wait, what was that? <laughs> Why? Because you understand that you are so small and vulnerable and weak, and you're in need of someone else. Maybe that's why nature is so beautiful, because it puts us in the right place, because we tend to put, elevate ourselves to the place of God, but nature puts us down to earth and helps us to recognize that we are simply just living by the grace of God. At the same time, it puts God in the right place, because when you look at nature, his glory that's displayed, uh, you get an overwhelming sense that God is beautiful, like, even the tallest building that man created, it, it, like, you can go to Shenandoah Mountain, and it's, that's, that's taller than that. Like, you know, God's creation is so much greater, so much bigger, so much, uh, it, it's, it's more beautiful than anything. But here's the problem. Just like a lot of us have trouble appreciating art, like we have trouble appreciating the art of God. I remember one time I went to the National Gallery of Art in D.C. with my mom, who, who, who studied art, um, and, and she wanted to be an art major in, in high school, so she studied a lot of art, and so she was having the time of her life there. Like, she's looking at different drawings, paintings, and she's talking about, oh, I saw this in the books, and, and this is, like, this is the background story of this. I'm, I'm just walking there. I'm like, okay, that's a person. <laughs> that, that, that's a tree. Oh, David and Goliath. Finally, something I understand, right? <laughs> like, something in the Bible. And, and why is Goliath like that? that? That's what I'm thinking. Now, we look at the same piece of art, and I should be appreciating the art, but why do I not appreciate it in the same way that my mom would do? Well, it's because I lack knowledge. It's because when you have nonverbal communication, it's good, but sometimes it's not clear. You can know things about God through nonverbal communication or creation, but you don't know everything about God. And that's the problem that we have. Some people can understand that there is a God somewhere, but you don't know who he is specifically just by looking at nature. Actually, Romans 1.18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, how do they suppress the truth? For what we 
know about God is plain to them because God has shown to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So what Paul is saying is what God created, uh, the nature, creation, in that God's invisible qualities and his power is displayed. However, people tend to suppress the truth. Although there's a beautiful drawing, a painting, just like we don't appreciate it because we don't recognize it. In the same way, although all around us, there's this God's creation and his masterpiece and his artwork, we don't appreciate it because one thing is that we're very ignorant. Another thing is that we lack knowledge. And this is where the psalm transitions into the second portion. David no longer talks about the nonverbal communication of God, but it talks about the clear communication of God. It says in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So now we're jumping from nature to the law of the Lord, scripture. So God speaks through nature in a general way, but God speaks through scripture in a specific way, okay? So God speaks through nature in a general way. You kind of have an idea of God, but God speaks through scripture specifically so that you can know God in a perfect way and real and a personal way. In verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And it goes on and on and on. So the law of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, those are all synonyms that are pointing to the fact that the written word of God, Scripture, the Bible, is, is this. That's what the Bible is saying. So what is it? Number one, it is perfect. It says the law of the Lord is it's perfect. It is flawless. It is whole. There is no error within it. No, from nature, you can learn some things about God. From God's word, his written word, you can learn all things about God. Everything that you have to know, everything that, that God wants to, to, to tell you, it's in scripture. It's, it's there. Not only is it perfect, but we see that it is sure, meaning it is trustworthy. Because God's word is perfect and flawless, we can trust it. We can bank on it. We, we can believe in it. Um, because everything is true there, we can take it for what it is. And we see that, that this is so encouraging to us because what David is saying is this. Think about the life of David. He was a, he was a king, but before he was a king, he was a shepherd. He was a nobody who became somebody, right? Um, but just think about his life. He knows how to live a normal life, he also knows what it's like to live a special life as a king. He knows what it's like to, to live in power. He knows what it's like to stand before a giant. He knows what it's like to slay a giant. He knows what it's like to walk in victory. He also knows what it's like to walk in defeat because he went through many trials and troubles and tribulations. He knows what it's like to be threatened for his life. He's know, he knows what it's like to have in-law problems because literally his father-in-law was trying to kill him. Uh, he knows what it's like to be alone. Um, because many times he was alone. He knows what it's like to be the youngest kid. Uh, and he knows what it's like to be tempted and to fall deeply into sin. He knows what it's like to betray and to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to have a child die and also to have a child betray him. He knows what it's like to live in a messed up world, to live in the midst of a messed up marriage, to live in the midst of a messed up family. And what he's saying is this, after seeing all of that, going through all of that, the one thing that is sure, the one thing that is true, the one thing that is perfect is the word of God. The one thing that is getting me through all this is the word of God. That's what he's saying. Things come and go high and low, but in the midst of all that, he's saying the word of God is keeping me here and and he says, not only is the word of God perfect and trustworthy, but it is right. And the word right here is this idea that the word of God is straight. It's, it's a straight edge. It's like a ruler, right? It's the standard. And so when you judge something, if, you, if you're not sure whether a line is straight or not, all you have to do is you take a ruler and you place it next to a line, and you're going to see if it's straight or not because that's the standard. What, what the Bible is saying is this. The word of God is your standard. It helps you to see what's right, what's wrong, what's off, and what's on, 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 uh, what's on the dot. And it helps you to ju judge all things in your life. You know, in our sinfulness, in our human tendency, we have this tendency to judge God's word. 
to pick God's word. We feel like this word is relevant now. This word is not that relevant culturally. It's not sound. And we have put our opinion upon God's word. What the Bible is saying is this. The word of God is not the object of your judgment. It is the source of your judgment. The word of God is what should determine everything else about you. The word of God is what you cling on to. Now, how do you know that if you're making God's word the source or the object of your judgment? Well, when you read the Bible, if you're constantly asking the question, is it okay to do this or do that? Is it okay for me to, to I guess, you know, walk in sin? Is it okay for me to, to go out and party? Is it okay for me to drink? Is it okay to, for me to to sleep with someone before marriage, and all these different things. I'm not trying to put an opinion right now, but what I'm saying is this. In the question, what you're trying to do is you're trying to force God's word upon a reality in your life. That's what I'm trying to say. You're trying to see how far you can go without falling. When the word of God is the standard, the question is is, is not, is it okay? The question is, what should I do? Like, what's the most honoring thing to God? How should I live out this this, this, this relationship that I have with this lady? How should I live out my, my, my career with integrity and honesty? Like, what should I think about my money? It's not about, is it okay, or how far can I go and have my way without kind of making God mad or angry? It's about pleasing God. It's about understanding that the word of God is perfect. It is flawless. It is sure. You can trust it. It is there for you because it is always teaching you what is right. It says in verse 9, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous, all together. So it's not just parts of God's word. All together, they are righteous. So the perfection of Scripture we see. But the next thing that we see is the power of Scripture. Look at how the word of God is described. The law of the Lord in verse 7 revives the soul. When you are downcast, when you are confused, when your soul is either in sin or away or discouraged, it says it can revive your soul. Like it transforms you from the inside out. When you are hopeless, it gives you hope. It like, it, that's something that's remarkable. Not only does it transform your heart, it transforms your mind. Notice it says the testimony of the Lord in verse 7 is sure, making the simple wise. The simple becomes wise. In other words, the word of God gives wisdom. And you might think, well, I have a PhD. I have my master's degree. I have two master's degree. Right? I'm a double master. Uh, or maybe you feel good about all the certifications that you have, and you feel like, well, I'm a well-educated man or a woman. I have a nice career. Um, but just think about it. I love how uh, Pastor Tim Keller kind of talks about this. He says, think back to 10 years ago, like how you were, 15 years ago. Like, and think about the decisions that you made, the life that you lived. Are you proud about yourself? Or maybe if you're kind of on the older side, go back like maybe 30 years. Uh, but like, <laughs> but, but like, a lot of times you don't have to go that back in time. Like a lot of times we would say, I wish I can go back to my teenage years. I wish I can go back to my childhood. Why? Because if I had the knowledge and the wisdom that I have right now, if I understand the world that, that how it is right now, then I would use my time differently. I would make different decisions. Like, oh man, I was a fool back then. I didn't know anything. Notice, if you continue to live like this, you're going to say the same thing in 10 years. In other words, you're a fool right now. Unless there's something outside that teaches you how not to be a fool. And that's what the Word of God does. It makes the simple wise. Not only that, it enlightens the eyes. Not only does it give wisdom and knowledge, but it gives perspective. You get to see how to interpret different situations or how to handle different people it gives you perspective. It shines light. In the midst of a dark world, it's like it brings, it helps you see what's real and what's not real. And so it brings perspective. And this is the thing that really I struggled with when I was meditating on this. In verse 10, it says, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So not only is the word of God powerful not only is the word of god perfect but we see that it is delightful it says in verse 8 the precepts of the lord are right rejoicing the heart so it's actually fun 
It's, it, it brings joy, the light. It is a beautiful thing. It is so precious to the point that you can have much fine gold. Someone can put millions of dollars in front of you, and you would say, instead of taking that, I would rather take the word of God. Someone can put the most beautiful meal in front of you, created by the best chef, and you would say, I would rather have the word of God than that. That's how much David loves the word of God. Why? Because not only is it glorifying to God to live according to God's word, but it is good for our souls. He's saying that I would rather feast on this than anything else. It is delightful. So the word of God, it is perfect. It's, it's powerful. It's delightful. We also see that it is personal. One thing that you notice from verse 1 through 6, there's only one mention of God. And the title that is used is El, which is a general name of God. From verses 7 to 9, in three short verses, six mentionings of God. And the title that is used is not God, it is L-O-R-D, capitalized. Which we know by this point, hopefully, in the past two weeks we talked about this, it's the word Yahweh, the Hebrew word, the personal name of God. God's covenantal name the name that he gave to Moses first and to his people. And so what's that's t- what, what that's telling us is this. Through the word of God, when you look at nature, you can have a general relationship with God and a general idea of God. But when you look at scripture, that knowledge becomes personal. No longer is he just a God out there, but he's your Lord, the Lord of your life. So the word of God is perfect. It is powerful. It is personal. It is delightful. So just to throw a couple application points at this point. So how are you doing with the Word of God? You know, we had, the, we had the Bible reading plan this year. Are you spending time in God's Word? Are you finding His Word like, it, it, delightful? And are you enjoying His Word? I think one reason why we struggle to really enjoy God's Word, and some people say this, I have no intentions whatsoever to read God's Word. I just have no desire to read it. And I think the answer to your question is, if that's the case, you have to read it. Because what that means is, if you never even try to read God's word, you're never going to develop a taste for it. Like, when I was young, I hated seafood. Because uh, my grandfather, like, we always, we, uh, in my childhood, we, he lived at our house. Right? Actually, we lived at his house. We lived together. And, uh, and he would always cook seafood. And, like, I, I hated it. I hated the smell. I didn't like it. And then one day, you know, I went to, when I was an adult, I went to a restaurant and I ate sushi, right? And, and it was like a different world. Like, how can something like this, like, exist? And so, and so but all my life, I've been neglecting seafood. I was like, I'm never going to eat sushi. I'm never going to eat sushi. And the moment I taste it, and the more I eat it, by the way, I develop these taste buds. Like, I, I, I know, like, what tastes good and what doesn't. And the same is true with the Word of God. Until you begin to read it, until you actually get used to its taste, you'll never enjoy it. You'll never enjoy it if you're always eating spiritual junk food. When you're constantly looking at your phone, you're constantly hearing stuff from the radio, from the TV, and things that are against God's word, things that are about this wor- world. I'm not saying that you have to cut everything off, but what I'm saying is, if that's your main diet, spiritual diet, then there might be a problem. Like, even for Timothy, when he eats so many snacks, he never eats the real meal. But the real meal is the one that really gives nutrition and, and, and energy and strength for him. In the same way, I think the reason why we struggle to read God's word is because we feast on spiritual junk food. For some of us, the reason why we don't find the word of God delightful is because we know it, but we never live it out. Like, notice that God says, this is not just something that you know up here. It's something that would becomes a standard of your life, and you apply it. You live according to it. You, you try to adjust your life to God's word, obedience. And when you begin to obey, you're going to see the fruit of God's word. It talks about how in verse 11, Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. When you keep the word of God, there is a great reward. And the last reason why I think we fail to really appreciate God's word and enjoy God's word is because a lot of times... We read God's word to learn instead of to love the Lord. Like, we read God's word as if this is a textbook, and we just gather information. So our mind is full of of information and, and knowledge. 
And yet we miss out on the exact point of Scripture, what the Pharisees, you know, they thought studying the Scriptures, it would make them wise and holy. Jesus said to them, well, Scriptures, it points to me. God's Word, it points to me. It's, it's all about me. And so I think a lot of times when we're reading this, we have to remember the whole point of reading the Bible is not just to upgrade your life. It's not just to live a better life. It's to love the Lord. It's to know your Lord, to understand who he is. I love what it says in John 1. It says, in the beginning was capital W word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, talking about Jesus who came in flesh. And he was there in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So it says, in Jesus Christ, there is life and light. Creation, to some degree, displays the life and light of God. At the same time, Jesus perfectly demonstrates life and light of God because he's the one who brings true perspective, not just in the physical world, but in the spiritual world as well. He's the one who gives true life, not just to our physical life, but spiritual life as well. Like, he helps us see things in a different way. He helps, to live, helps us live in a different way. Hebrews 1, uh, verse 1 and 2 says this, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And so the whole point of Scripture is to speak to us. God is speaking to us through his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So, what is our humble response? I think at the end of the day, we have to take home this, this, this message and really wrestle with it, understanding that it's not just about living according to God's word and trying to do everything in God's word. Because if you try to do that, you will quickly be discouraged because God's word is perfect, is perfect and you're not. Like there's no way we can live out this word on our own. And that's why David prays this prayer at the very end. Verse 12, whom can discern his errors, declare me innocent from hidden faults. And verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. The psalm begins with God's word. It ends with this relationship with God. After seeing all this, what David says is, I'm not just thankful that I have all this information and tips on how to live life. After reading all this, he says, I'm thankful that you are my rock. And you are my redeemer. And he says, because who you are, I want my words and the meditation of my heart. In other words, anything that's outside and anything that's inside, I want that to be pleasing to your sight. So God speaks to us in a general way through nature. God speaks to us in a specific way through scripture. God speaks to us in the ultimate way through his son. Don't miss out on it. Let's pray.